Right, so I'm here. So I'm here in the uh, Red River Gorge right now on the eastern side, sort of towards the uh, Clifty Wilderness uh, on, I think the Wildcat Trail or maybe maybe the one right above it. Um, yeah, so this is uh, a whole like really interesting ecosystem here. Um, lots of this Cypripedium alcale. It seems like these were too young to flower this year, but it's pretty awesome. Uh, there's also the Pipsisua, the Chemophila maculata. The family Ericaceae, you can see those ten stamens there. Uh, the uh, the wintergreen, one of the, one of the wintergreens. They got a lot of sassafras seedlings too. These are kind of fuzzy, and then like when they get bigger, they'll have the uh, the ones that shape the ones that are shaped like mittens or um, ones that have like a trident kind of thing. You also got maple leaf viburnum here. This is um, viburnum acerifolium. Pretty cool, a little too young to flower. Lots of uh, Quercus. Got a couple of uh, ones that look like they've flowered, or a couple of Cypripedium that look like they flowered, including this one here that actually has a, a fruit, developing fruit on it. That's kind of focus. Yeah, nice. All right, so a little further down the way here, we've got um, a lot of this ericaceous shrub. This is uh, Calmia latifolia, the mountain laurel. Uh, yeah, family Ericaceae, pretty awesome. You also got some of these, uh, Vaccinium. I'm not really sure which species this is without the flowers and everything. Lots of small uh, chinkapin oak. This is Quercus muhlenbergii. Not sure who Muhlenberg was, but it's got that uh, nice kind of fuzzy surface on the leaves. Pretty awesome. And over there we got uh, Magnolia macrophylla. That's the uh, Magnolia, I think it's the, the largest leaf of any native plant that we have here in Kentucky, probably the eastern United States. Some of the, the leaves can get like up to three feet long or so. They get pretty enormous. And even though there's no flowers on this right now, uh, this is pretty clearly uh, in the family Iridaceae. So probably an iris. Uh, we also get Cisrinchium up here. Uh, those look like grass for the most part though. And this is pretty distinctly an iris, I think. And uh, we really only get one, probably, well, one or two species. And this is probably Iris cristata, the dwarf crested iris, from which many, many horticultural cultivars have come from. And here in, uh, what, I think one of the most interesting habitats that you can find in the gorge here are uh, these, like, wet limestone seeps that sort of overhang everywhere, and there's quite a few of them, too, also sandstone down here in the gorge. Uh, this here is another member of the family Ericaceae. This is Michella uh, repens, I believe is the species name. And it makes a nice little uh, bifurcate berry. So it has two flowers and then it makes one berry that is sort of joined in the middle. Uh, over here also you got a pretty common species. This is Heuchera americana, uh, not to be confused with uh, Tilia, or not, sorry, not Tilia, um, Tiarella cordifolia, that's also in this area. And the two can actually hybridize, and that's how you get the, uh, the heucorellas from the garden center and stuff like that. And this looks like a Christmas fern. Pretty nice. You got the sori on there. Nice. Oh, well, it looks like you also got some orchids, too. This is a uh, Goodyera uh, pubescens. Yeah, one of our native orchids here. All right, so this is what I was talking about with uh, the large leaves on this magnolia species. So I had to put the put the camera in the fisheye mode. So this is a uh, pretty, pretty freaking huge leaf. This is magnolia macrophylla, uh, aptly named, I think. This is probably one of the largest leaves I've ever seen on this on this species. And it's actually not that tall. It's about maybe six, six and a half feet tall. Yeah, enormous leaves. All right, and then right next to the magnolia, this is Oxydendrum arboreum. This is the only uh, native tree, like actual tree member of Ericaceae uh, that we have here in the eastern U.S. So it's also called sourwood, um, and it makes these big, long racemes of uh, flowers that sort of look like a blueberry, but they're all in a straight line and everything, so it's kind of an odd... Uh, floral structure for that. So you got those tiny little serrate margins on there, and then the underside usually is about the same.
It's got some small hairs and stuff on the mid rib. But yeah, these can get these can get I think upwards of 60 feet tall. Yeah, one of my favorite trees for sure. Alright, so over here in the deep shade, we've got a pretty small plant uh, that I think it is often overlooked just because it's like kind of weedy a lot of the time. Uh, this is Smilax bona nox, uh, and it has these interesting variegated leaves on it and everything. Um, and these can really take over trees. This is one of the uh, one of the green briars uh, that people use to make uh, like jelly and stuff like that back in the old days, or to like thicken soup, soups and stews uh, with their roots because they contain a lot of pectin. Uh, and this one is a fly pollinated uh, member of the. Berberidaceae family, I think. Um, it's uh, got these like really stinky flowers uh, in the late summer and everything, especially when it gets really tall and makes these bright blue berries that get bird dispersed. Pretty awesome. And it also has a symbiotic relationship with ants uh, sometimes. There are some members of the species that will actually produce pearl bodies on the leaves or on the undersides of the leaves to uh, get the ants to come protect them. So this is probably a member of the Polypodium genus, uh, probably Polypodium Appalachianum or maybe Virginianum, probably Virginianum, that's a little more common. You can see the sori developing on there. Yeah, it just covers this limestone boulder, pretty awesome. We also got some flowering Gudera pubescens there, so those will probably be open in a week or two. Pretty nice. Well, this is one of two of our native Dioscoria species, in the family Dioscoriaceae, the uh, wild yam family. Um, we get lots of invasive members of this here, like Dioscoria elephantipes and Dioscoria bulbifera, and those are uh, Asian species. This is Dioscoria villosa, and people can eat the roots. Um, I don't recommend that because this is not a terribly, terribly common plant. So maybe just leave it. Just leave it alone. But it's got leaves and whorls, uh, six and sometimes three when it has uh, these runners. It doesn't always produce these long vines. Sometimes it just stays like this guy over here. So in this little cut area where it looks like a tree fell and they just removed a bunch of the, uh, the old stuff here. Uh, left a pretty big gap in the canopy and that seems to have allowed this guy to sprout because I haven't seen it anywhere else. Uh, this is Nabulus or Nabulus altissima in the family Asteraceae. Uh, one of the copious amounts of plants uh, given the common name rattlesnake root uh, which I think is just absurd. Don't use common names that's really dumb. Anyway it makes these nice really dissected leaves. Uh, it starts off the first year or the first year or two uh, as like a little basal rosette kind of thing. Maybe it has like one or two leaves. And then it starts making these uh, small triangular leaves and they just get gradually more dissected as they go up. And then the pauline leaves, once it starts to bolt, uh, sort of return to that shape that they were in the beginning. Pretty cool. So growing under this little sourwood here, we have uh, some small seedlings of a plant called Hamamelis virginiana in the family Hamamelidaceae in the order Phagales. So this is most closely related to uh, oaks and beech and stuff like that. Yeah, so it has these nice asymmetric leaves. Uh, this is witch hazel is the common name. It makes these nice uh, yellow spindly petals on its flowers and it uh, is pollinated, uh, or sorry, not pollinated, dispersed uh, by increasing the pressure inside those seed pods when it dries out and then making all the seeds in there just explode everywhere. Pretty effective in getting those seeds to not be right under the mother plant. Which uh, right here I don't even see one. Alright, so this is a very interesting plant. It's really not found anywhere else except for 
uh, the Appalachian region, and this is a little bit west of the Appalachian Mountains, but still sort of the same ecosystem. Uh, this is Pyrolaria pubera, and it is a hemiparasitic uh, shrub or subshrub uh, in the order Santaleles in the family Santalaceae. So it's the same uh, order and family as a lot of mistletoes and everything. And so it uses a uh, fungal partner to interface uh, with its hostoria, which it then uh, puts into the ground to find other trees, such as uh, probably not that one because it's dead, maybe the sourwood or maybe the oak over there as well. Uh, and these can get much larger. I've seen them probably about 12 feet tall at maximum. Um, and they do have interesting uh, inflorescences, little signs of uh, green flowers with white uh, anthers on them in the uh, sort of like mid to late summer. And these are pretty small. So this, as you might know, uh, is a, an eastern hemlock. This is Tsuga canadensis. Um, and I want to show you something that's really affecting a lot of the trees around here, and that is this little white bug here. Uh, this is an insect in the order Hemiptera, so it's a true bug um, with a little sucking mouth part, uh, and it affects eastern hemlock uh, pretty intensely. It can actually kill an entire tree in a season or two, uh, and oftentimes you will see them uh, even more covered than this. Sometimes the entire underside of a branch will be entirely uh, white. And so this is a huge problem here, um, and they're trying to treat them with imidacloprid uh, as a way to keep them off of the trees themselves, but it doesn't really seem to be working on the scale that uh, they'd hoped. So um, if you do encounter this sometime when you're in the woods or whatever, uh, do know that's what that is and try to uh, figure out ways to control it if you would be so kind. All right, so this is a tree that I'm sure a lot of people will recognize just on sight because it's so distinct. Uh, this is the American chestnut. Yeah, so this is uh, Castanea dentata, uh, which is not a very uncommon thing to find here, actually. You just won't see them get, like, super duper huge. Um, I have seen some, some, like, really, really old trees, like trees that are maybe 150 plus years old that are, you know, looking a little scraggly, but uh, it's pretty common to find these like one one or two season old um, uh, shoots because the blight has not had a chance to uh, kill them off yet. And so the way that the blight works on it uh, is it produces oxalic acid and then the plant doesn't really know what to do with that because it doesn't have a mechanism in order to get rid of that. Uh, and so it just kind of girdles it and then it dies. And then it'll probably re-sprout again from the base and... These big trees have been doing this for, you know, almost a hundred years now, a little bit over a hundred years actually in some places. Yeah, so pretty cool to find. All right, so I'm in a different part of the gorge right now. This is uh, maybe a little bit north of where I was earlier. This is Adiantum pedatum, which is a pretty common uh, fern. It has this interesting rachis that just uh, bifurcates over and over and over until it goes, you know, most of the way around. It's uh, got that pedate kind of shape to it. The, uh, the sori on this are pretty much the same, uh, or they're ra rather they're on the same kind of frond uh, as the, uh, the sterile ones are. Fertile and sterile fronds look about the same. Pretty cool. And then right next to it we got, uh, this is pawpaw. This is uh, Asamina triloba. We get a couple of different pawpaw species, but this is by far the most ubiquitous. Um, they do get pretty large. Um, they do form like like uh, clonal colonies, so you get a lot of old songs and stuff. Or like way down yonder in the pawpaw patch, those pawpaw patches are uh, clonal communities of these kinds of trees. And the fruit's pretty good too. Right here, we got one of my favorite ferns. This is uh, Thigopterus hexagonoptera. It's a really interesting, uh, pretty, pretty uncommon fern. Looks a lot like uh, Woodwardia. It's got these in, these uh, pinnates or bipinnate leaves or bipinnate fronds, 
that are like really shallowly bipinnates, but they're very di like distinctly pinnate though. And they always have this uh, triangle shape to them where this, this frond goes out this way, that frond goes out this way, so we're like, choo, 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 you know, nice. So this is about the only one I've seen of this species so far, at least on this part of the part of the trail. Uh, this is Hydrangea arborescens, and yeah, so this this is one of our native hydrangeas, uh, and this is also the uh, parent species of uh, lots of different cultivars like limelights and Annabelle and a few of the oak leaf hybrids as well. But yeah, pretty cool. So this is a pretty ubiquitous species throughout much of the eastern U.S. This is um, Asarum canadense, and it's uh, a member of the Aristolochiaceae family. Uh, so it's related to Dutchman's pipe vine and all that, and the common name for it is wild ginger. Uh, personally, I don't really think the rhizomes smell all that much like ginger. Um, they do taste like it a little bit, though. But it smells, uh, honestly, quite strongly of patchouli. <laughs> so do with that what you will. It's a nice species.